All right, so describe how nationalism was a key part of Germany's unification. So think about where Kaiser Wilhelm I was crowned as the German Kaiser, our emperor, king, right? So think about that and why that might be a part of Germany's plan, maybe to boost morale even more, boost more nationalism. Okay. So after we finish this, reviewing this unification process, I do want to talk about imperialism, the Berlin Conference, and then we'll dive right into our game. We'll probably go down the cafeteria just so we have a little bit more room and that we don't see the dice flying around all, all over the floor and we have a little bit more table space. So that'll be good. That'll be good. Yeah. All right, so nationalism, what does it mean again? I know we talked about this quite a bit already, but go ahead. Yeah, good job. So a strong sense of national pride. So you're proud to be a part of this country. And for Germany especially, right, as they're divided up amongst a lot of these German-speaking states and entities of Central Europe, after the fall of the Holy Roman Empire and after the Napoleonic Wars, well, they needed to unite, right? Bismarck realized from Prussia, one of the German-speaking states, one of the strongest ones, where the innovation was all happening, that if Germany wants to rise as a world power to compete with, let's say, France, compete with uh, Austria or even Great Britain, they need to come together. They need to unify. So he utilizes nationalism to unify Germany. So yesterday we talked about a few examples. How do they do so? How did Bismarck bring Germany together? Go ahead. Yeah, good job, right? So what better way to try to inspire nationalism than beating up your neighbors? Especially when Austria was known as one of the strongest land militaries in the world. And when you look at France, right? Just 50 years before this, 60 years before this, the Napoleonic Wars really and France controlled pretty much all of continental Europe. So yeah, if you beat up your neighbors, well, that will show and bring a sense of nationalism that might unify Germany together. So yeah, we talked about the Austro-Prussian War, right? We talked about the War of Denmark, and we also talked about the Franco-Prussian War. How did Bismarck and Germany defeat these powers fast and quick within weeks, months even? Go ahead. The railway system that was spread all around Germany. Yeah, good job. 
awesome. Good job. Good job, right? So when you're looking at Great Britain, yeah, they had some interconnection of the railroad system. United States, okay, which we'll talk a little bit about here soon, what's going on with them. But Germany, yeah, they had the interconnection of this railroad system that allowed them to mobilize troops. Okay, they could send military equipment and supplies to the front lines fast and efficient before, you know, these uh, opposition arrivals, okay, the enemies, let's say, with Austria, Denmark, and France, before they could even defend themselves. So they were already right there at the doorstep before France even knew what was going to happen, knew what was going on. Okay. Good, good. So, yeah, the railroad system was definitely utilized for this war for Germany to really propel themselves to winning these wars in a fast manner. Also, we talked a little bit about the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. It occurred in Germany, it happened there. So, a lot of the new innovations of warfare and military equipment, okay, that's all starting, that's all originating in Germany. So they get they get they got their hands on it before really anybody else. All right, uh, what else? What other form of nationalism now? So yesterday we talked a little bit about culture with Germany, right? Okay, go ahead, Paul. Uh, did we start writing like folk tales? Yeah, folk tales, right? The Brothers Grimm. You guys read a little bit about that yesterday. Okay, one of the biggest stories you guys know is Snow White, right? Yeah, okay. Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. The Cinderella is included in that. Rumpel Stiltskin. What? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, all right. Also, Gretel, the witch hunters. Anyway, so anyway, there's a lot of stories there that's really impacting and bringing the culture together, right? Bismarck realized, yeah, warfare is going to really propel us with iron and blood, but at the same time, you got to look at culture. You need to have some sort of uh, linkage with the people of Germany and bring them together to cause and start a culture. All right, good, good. Uh, so as Germany, right, unifies after they defeat France in a war. Where was the new emperor, the Kaiser? Where was he crowned? Which is another way to try to boost morale, nationalism for the German people. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, okay, okay. What palace though do we talk about quite a bit? Palace of Versailles. Yeah, the Palace of Versailles. Good, good. So the Palace of Versailles, they crown Kaiser Wilhelm the first. Okay, that's where they symbolize this unification process where Germany is becoming whole. Right, what better way to throw salt in the wound to your neighbor, right? To your rival, your opposition, and crowning your king, your Kaiser, right? At one of the palaces that we talked quite a bit about. Right? Yesterday I showed you the portrait there. Where were they at in the palace of Versailles? Go ahead, Parker. All the mirrors, yeah, good job. So with the hallway of mirrors, right? That was shown as this symbol of prestige, this symbol of power. And well, now Germany's utilizing that as a stepping stone to propel them as the next world power, one that will rival Great Britain. <laughs> all right, good, good, good. So Bismarck all, also right. used a, an idea with politics. What was that called? That he's not going to try to view in an ideology. He's not going to side one side or the other. He's going to use common sense. He's going to use practices and principles that will make sure Germany reaches the objective of being a world power. Not allowing these political parties to tear Germany apart from the inside. Bonner? Real quality. Yeah, real quality. Yeah, good job. Good job. So, again, using common sense, right? You're not allowing these political parties to cause issues and problems internally. Let's face it, in the United States, even today, right, with these political parties, more than ever, really, uh, they're all, always at their throats. So, again, Back in the 1850s here, mid 1800s, Bismarck's saying, well, we need to try to unite on a certain objective, making a world power, creating a world power. And we can't allow politics to rip us apart. Right? I also talked about controlling the Catholic Church, right? Making sure that this institution doesn't get too out of control. Like we talked previously with this reformation process, how corrupt the church was and how much influence it has on the people. He also infused a welfare system, right? And uh, allowing people to have opportunity, rights to vote, serve in government, right? And uh, when it comes to social security, even applying these social safety nets for people and appeasing the left side of the aisle. So yeah, Bismarck was more conservative. He was more on the right side, but he also realized that to make sure that the other side, the other corporate party on the left is happy, right? Content. So that's why this welfare system was put in place. All right, is there any questions here on German unification? So you had that article yesterday. If you haven't done so already, please turn that in. Four questions. And then uh, I wanted to make sure we got this down because nationalism is a huge, huge term. Like I've told you, remember, leading up to World War One. 
and with this unification process. All right, here's your terms. You only got two of them. That's it. And that's it for the chapter. All right, so there you go. Imperialism and the Berlin Conference, 1884. So this conference, which we're going to talk a little bit about today, that's going to lead us right into our game, the scramble for Africa. The simulation of how these European countries were taking over these territories in Africa. All right. Okay. So imperialism, we're, we're going to talk about that here in the notes. I just want to make sure I can get to the game here. So we're going to move right into the, right into the presentation. But real quick, here's a nice political cartoon that's detailing about this time, right? And uh, what's going on in Europe and Africa, obviously, in the late 1800s, building up to World War I. Okay. These European countries were all modernized. They're all industrialized right at the same time. They're advancing when it came to uh, weaponry, when it comes to militarism. That's a term we're going to talk quite a bit about in World War I. So really the ramp up, the buildup of the military, putting a lot of funding towards it to stay innovative, to stay on the cutting edge when it comes to these new forms of weaponry. All right. So yeah, when you think of militarism, that's kind of happening already with Germany as they're being and, and forming into a world power. All right. So we'll say that more to World War I. But in any case, Right, these European countries, as they're growing, as they're becoming dominant, right, as they're becoming competitive with one another, they want to have a leading edge. And the only way to do that is to extract resources, materials from other lands, other areas. When you look at Europe, what's going on? When you look at Europe, when you see the map, is Europe big? Is it large? Now, there's a lot of countries in Europe, obviously, right? And they're limited to what? Land. And if they're limited to land, they're limited to what? Resources, right? Raw materials. So in order to grow, in order to become stronger, okay, to become dominant, they have to look elsewhere. What better place than the huge continent of Africa? It's right here, not too far away. And they can apply their marketplaces by extracting these resources from Africa. All right, so one of the terms I was going to put on, but it's kind of self-explanatory, it's called extractive economies. It literally means what it states right they're extracting these resources and raw materials from africa okay a lot of it being diamonds a lot of it being gold 
and eventually some of the materials to make rubber, right? Obviously with tires, that's important. Hello? Yeah. Yep. Pass the dollar. Let's go down to this map. something. All right. So, yeah, with Africa, it's abundant with resources and materials. And that's only going to grow these countries moving forward. So that political cartoon, I think that does a really good representation of the time. Here are all these European powers that are surrounding Africa. It looks like they're pulling on it, right? And it's limited, right? It's only as big as what you can obviously see there. So they're tugging on either end, trying to grab as much territory as possible. Right? Another thing, too, with this territory, what can they establish there? A sphere of influence, but what else? What's that, Connor? All right, colonies, yep, good job, and military bases, right? So one thing to note, this is a little bit different than the age of exploration. It's not like they're establishing these colonies all throughout Africa. More or less, they're sending somewhat of a skeleton crew, that's what they call it, a military force there. And with their advancements, they control it just with a small number of people, and uh, they utilize the resources to their advantage. So they're not infusing a lot of resources. They're not spending a lot of money and colonizing this whole area. Okay, they just have a stronger military there for a short time. They're extracting the resources, making the people that already live there, the indigenous people, work as slaves to extract the resources. So with this chapter here, we're moving into imperialism. So you just define this term, so everybody should have this already. But imperialism, in simple terms, it's if you're bigger, you're stronger, right? And if you want a resource, right, or materials, you just take it from someone that is weaker, right? You're bigger, you're stronger, you're more powerful, you're more dominant. In this case, if you have more of an innovative military, you're going to take what you want. It's like the bully, right? If you guys maybe have a brother or sister, right? So if uh, your brother or sister wants, let's say, an item, like a PlayStation, you play a PlayStation or something like that, it'll just come in, grab the controller, push you out of the way, and there's nothing you can do. So that's what imperialism is. Okay, imperialism is utilizing your resources, your advancements, your power to get what you want. Strongest will survive, survival of the fittest. I'm sure you guys heard of that before. And how they're applying this theory of evolution to what's going on during this time. It's called social Darwinism. Okay, social Darwinism. That's another term they mentioned too long. Oh, all right. It is what it is. You guys get it. So with imperialism, Again, a good example, if you have a brother or sister, my brother is six still, right? He is six still. He's a lot bigger than me, obviously. I'm not too tall. But when I was younger, he would just come in, grab the PlayStation controller out of my hands, kick it to the side, and there's no way I can fight back because he's bigger. He's stronger. He yeah, the PS1. Yeah, PS1. So yeah, he would beat me up, take it, and again, nothing I can do about it. That's exactly what these European countries are doing in Africa. They're extracting the resources. They're actually forcing these indigenous people to work as slaves in their own country. All right, so you'll find a lot of political cartoons that are attached to this presentation. That's indicating the time. That's describing of the time. All right, so reasons. Well, there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> Number one, resources, materials that you can't find really in your own country. You're limited. Again, if you're Europe, you only have a limited amount of land, a limited amount of resources. Uh, that are there. So you got to look elsewhere. You got to find other places where you can extract these resources and apply it to your own marketplace. Again, with wealth comes what? With wealth comes what? The power, right? Power. Uh, ports around the world, right? So that's going to help with trade. That's going to help expand your imperialistic empire even more. So for Great Britain, especially, they control a lot of land in Africa and Asia. They control all of India. Right, the uh, Southeast Indies, pretty much. Right, Australia, looking over into the Western Hemisphere. Okay, like I mentioned, with the British Empire, they always said that the sun never sets over. That's something to know, right? Especially during this time here. These other countries that are trying to catch up, like Germany, they're getting to the game a little bit late. They just unified, so for them, they're going to try to do their best to expand their markets, expand their imperialist uh, views. I set up missionaries, obviously with. Religion has still very important, still high priority. And then, like I mentioned, survival of the fittest. Okay, so there's a quote you'll find there in the presentation, the white man's burden. It talks a little bit about imperialism and mentions just how cruel it is to the indigenous people, right? How hard it is, right, uh, for 
uh, the indigenous people in these areas all around the world that the European countries are dominating. Here they are working as slaves within their own country. They're extracting the resources to try to benefit, let's say, a European country like Great Britain to grow them as world power. And again, they're just used as tools or used as slaves within their own country. All right, so why Western Europe? Well, industrialization, right? They saw the innovations already. Technology, military equipment, you name it. The idea is really endless. All right, is there any questions here for imperialism? Okay, all right, so we're going to move right to the assignment here. One of your terms was the Berlin Conference. What was that? Who wants to describe that for me? The Berlin Conference. Go ahead, Wyatt. What I remember, it was basically all the countries in Europe, they met in Berlin to talk about how colonization will work. Good. Good job. Good job. So, yep, yeah, it's in Berlin. So where's Berlin? Germany, right? Yeah, good job. So who do you think is going to lead this meeting, this conference with all the European leaders? Huh? No, no, no. The other guy we talked about. Bismarck. Yep. So Otto von Bismarck, we talked a lot about him already. He's going to lead the cause here at the Berlin Conference. And with the Berlin Conference, you'll find on the title page a political cartoon. It looks like they're carving up a big pie, a big cake. And that's exactly what their goal is. Dividing up the territories to try to avoid warfare, right? That's the goal. That's the idea anyway. All right, so with this game here, you're going to get in groups of four to five. Try to get in the groups of five. If there's a group of four, that's fine. So think about it. Think about it, right? Think about it. One person is going to get a packet, okay? One person, that's it. So whoever has the best handwriting, whoever has the best coloring skills, whoever can color in the lines of Africa, right? You guys, uh, that person will be the one writing down the, the answers to the questions and also coloring in the map of Africa, all right? So we'll get there here soon. So within your group, you're going to pick a country. So you can be either Great Britain, France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, right? It's really amazing. So like I said, I think it's better. Why I got it. Let me get through this. I think it's better if you have a group of five because it just makes more sense when it comes to the end result, right? There shouldn't be that many independent countries left. So here's the rules. As you indicate what country you are, you can label it with a color. So here is a key indicating what country you are. So if you're Great Britain, you want to be red, whatever, colored in red. France, if you're yellow, yellow. So that way you know what territories you dominate, you control, right, within Africa. Make sure you indicate, too, what territories you do gain. You can just put the color there. So like I said, if you're Great Britain and you just take over the Belgian Congo, you can just put a red stripe there. That's fine. Or highlight it, whatever. Okay? That's what I'm looking for. Then you can kind of move through it, no problem. We'll get, up, we'll get to the point system here towards the end. We'll talk about that when we kind of finish up the uh, simulation here. But also right here to the side, that's a, that's the country that controlled it in in real life and history, right? So it's going to be a little bit different, obviously, than your simulation. All right. So with this, what you're going to do is in your group, you're going to roll the dice to see who controls the territory. So you roll the dice, okay? And if two players roll a six while well, they're at war with one another, a four, five, or six. So let's say the highest number you guys roll is a four, right? You still have the ability to go to war, right? But if let's say someone has a five or six, obviously they get that territory. Does that make sense? It's pretty easy, right? If two players, let's say, roll the same number, that's a four, five, or six, and that's the highest number, then you two are at war with one another. Let's say you roll a three, two, or one. You can't compete then, okay? So then you guys will duke it out again. So you will roll whoever gets a higher number, they get the territory. One thing to note though, if you go to war with someone, and you lose the war, you can't go for the next territory. Why? You need to rebuild your troops, right? You need to send more troops down from Europe. You need to try to rebuild your military. That's why, okay? All right, one thing to note here is, as we're moving along here, rolling the dice, okay? And if you do lose, you can't go for the next territory. If everybody rolls and it's a one, two, or three, there's no four, five, or six. Those higher numbers aren't there. Let's say the highest number is a three. That means the African territory, the African tribe, they pushed you out. It won't happen a lot, but if it does, just write independent. Just write independent in the line here, okay? Independent, and then you just leave it white. Just leave it blank, okay, on the map. Does that make sense? 
All right. So it's pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty easy. I think you guys will have fun with it. We can go down and start a while in the cafeteria. Um, again, pick your groups. Groups of four or five. I want to see five. That's the goal. But if it's a group of four, that's fine, too. Uh, just leave it here. We'll be back. Um,